Hi, I'm Jan Vitkowski here at Coastby Harbour Laboratory and I welcome you to the 87th Coastby Harbour Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology and the topic this year is stem cells. And I'm very pleased to have Lawrence uh, Studer from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, to have a conversation with him uh, this afternoon. Uh, so Lawrence, the, the key thrust of your work of your laboratory is is trying to uh, produce mature different neurals, neural cell types. Exactly, that is definitely one of the main goals because we tried for many years to make cell types that we would like to ultimately use in the context of modeling disease or in context of using them for cell therapy. And so in this journey we had to go through many steps and one is really how to make the cell, what's the developmental specification to make the right cell, the right neuron, let's say a dopamine neuron for Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. But then also there's this big mystery, why does it take in humans so long for those cells to mature? It takes them actually often months if not years. This is in, in vitro or... That's, that's the interesting thing. So obviously you could think of many reasons why it might be different in vitro and vivo, but it turns out that it's in vitro or in vivo, they follow the same what seems to be an intrinsic clock of maturation. Mm -hmm. And some of our cells continue to develop until you are 20 years old all the way to puberty. And so you can imagine we cannot wake, wait 20 years in a dish <laughs> to get there, so we need to try to understand the, the signals and mechanisms that drive the maturation process. And it's still a pretty big mystery making some progress, but it's still a lot of work to do. So it's not simply um, producing an, an array of, ne of neuronal cell, cell types, but even, in, even within one particular lineage, trying to get that mature that cell mature enough to do what it should be doing. Exactly, it depends on what you want to do with it. So, for example, for cell therapy, sometimes you want to have very young cells that then can well adapt in a complex environment because they're still young. Mm -hmm. But then the, the trade-off is it takes them often a year or two years now before they're mature enough to function. So it's a very slow therapy, maybe long-lasting, but very slow. But for other applications, you want to study a disease in a dish, let's say Alzheimer's disease. That's a disease that typically occurs at 50, 60 years of age. Mm -hmm. And obviously if it's really intrinsic, we clearly cannot wait again 50 years for that time frame. So that is really kind of the, the puzzle. But we were very good for many, many years, now, nearly two decades, we focused primarily on making the cells. And we have now protocols, conditions that I'm going to talk about, where you can make up to 50 different cell types precisely, mm -hmm. one versus the other, figuring out the kind of, it's like a language of differentiation. And we spend a lot of time, I think we understand it pretty well. What we don't understand so well, once you make that cell, that cell to move forward. Now mm. that is kind of, what is really mm. this time, time axis? And I think that's one of the mysteries we try to tackle for the years to come and we have made some progress already. But you've had obviously considerable success in, in the initial stage of producing the, the variety of differentiated cells. Uh, uh, do you do this by using a variety of growth factors or is it s more simple culture medium manipulation? No, it is, it is really very much based on developmental biology. Mm -hmm. For example, we are very interested in the ectoderm lineage because the nervous system comes from the ectoderm. Sure. And we can just by manipulating four signaling pathways, so it's TGF, beta activin nodal is one, BMP, FGF and WINS. And so by understanding the right sequence of inhibition activation within those mm. pathways, you can make all the major early ectodermal lineage. So for example, the neural crest gives rise to peripheral nervous system, plug code gives rise to sensory structures, even the skin precursors, or then the nervous system, spinal cord and brain. So there's a pretty simple body plan once you understand it. But then from each of those lineages, now then there are multiple other steps. For example, we know how to make them brain cells that are more from the front, mm -hmm. so like the cortex, or that all the way from the back, the spinal cord. So there's another axis that you need to titrate in. And then there's also the time axis again, because mm. many cells make one cell type early on, they continue to make a second cell type, like people have described in Drosophila for many years. That happens also in those systems that's basically a progenitor that makes these fate decisions. So we can also push that time a little bit forward and backward to then make more one versus the other cell. So it's mm. very much steeped in developmental biology. Uh, it's not really drug screening or things like uh -huh. many people have tried. I think at the end, developmental biology wins. <laughs> so if you understand the embryo, I think you can apply that. Yeah. You really get the best results. Uh, so it's interesting. So you're, the, you're, the strategies that you employ are based on years of fundamental research, basic mm -hmm. research on 
by developmental biologists. Exactly. No, that's, I'm also part of a developmental biology program in addition to, to be director of the Stem Cell Center. So th th I'm very proud and, and I think it's absolutely crucial to have a good understanding of developmental biology for actually applying it to stem cell biology. Mm. And what, um, what sorts of, you, you've already mentioned Alzheimer's and, mm. uh, and Parkinson's and uh, you, were, you were driven to undertake this area of research mm. with the goal of applying it in neurodegenerative diseases. Mm. And exactly. And so again, there are these two strategies. One is to use the stem cells as a better model, a human model of the disease from the actual mm -hmm. patient. And the other one is using them as a therapeutic vehicle. And for using them as a model, again, something I'm going to talk about today, we have, for example, one trick to make the cells not only more mature, but make them aged. Mm. So where we did, in this case, actually genome-wide CRISPR screen, or trying to figure out what are the factors that in an AD context, in Alzheimer's disease context, compared to control context, actually do trigger the late stage symptoms of the disease, for example, degeneration. Mm. So we have now some tweaks where we can then add molecules to the cells, and that seems to take them to a stage where at least they mimic the aging process. We don't know whether it's true aging, that's something we're studying more, well, well. but we can mimic the aging process in a way where we now get access to those <laughs> late stage phenotype, which might be important for drug discovery, mm. for example. Mm. Well, of course, you, who, who quite knows what aging is exactly. in, in the, <laughs> in the broader context. <laughs> I remember the great discussions about whether it was a, a system-wide uh, yeah, phenomenon or cellular it's or, or it's whatever. It's a very interesting field. No, people have sometimes very strong opinions on what aging is, all the way from right. very mechanistic understanding. Always it's just the risk of cell death, yes. the risk of, of death, or right. increased risk when you get older, of organismal deaths. Yes. Um, so, uh, so in relation to Parkinson's, mm. what what uh, what work have you been doing? Yeah, so that's really an exciting area now, particularly on the translational side. So that's my two decades of trying to figure out all those signals have resulted in a strategy where we actually can make the cell that's lost in Parkinson's disease, the main cell, which is mm -hmm. dopamine neurons in the midbrain that cause all the movement, disease-related symptoms, and we can generate those in the numbers of billions, make them frozen, ready to go. <laughs> So like an actual drug product. And then we can inject them into actual patients. Obviously, we went first through mice, rats, monkeys, and so forth. So it was a, a decade-long quest. Mm. But in uh, late 2020, we got permission from the FDA to start a clinical trial. And so now, the last two years, basically, we've engaged in that first patient. It was in 2021, in May. And just about the last patient, it's just about literally about last week, got to the 12 months stage. And so we're very, very excited that we soon will be able to do a proper data cut, no statistical mm -hmm. analysis, and report on some of those results. Mm -hmm. But it, it has been a long journey, as you can imagine, well, first figuring out how to make the cells basic, then another 10 years how to make them good enough that the FDA thinks you know what you're making, and then obviously now the clinical trial. Yeah. Well, of course, we, we know Adrian Craner and Spin Ross, it took <laughs> essentially 15 years. For, sure. for anyway, but uh, so in the animal experiment, there mm -hmm. are animal models of Parkinson's? Sure. Yeah, so they're usually relatively simple models, the one we are using. We're also working on more complicated ones, but for cell therapy, it has to be very reproducible mm -hmm. model. And so these are basically dopamine depletion models. So you want to replace dopamine neurons. And by the time you come to a neurologist with Parkinson's symptoms, more than half of all those cells have been lost. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly due to a cell loss problem. So that loss you can mimic in an animal by giving it basically a drug, even unilateral on one side to then mimic that loss. And once it has the loss, you can replace it with the cells you generated in a dish. Right. But your, th your therapy is, is replacing the, the mature cell, so to speak, the dopamine-producing so, cell. Exactly. Do so, the, those cells will die off? Will they die off? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Again, come back to the maturation discussion. Now we put them in at a relatively young stage. Mm. That's why the readout has to be at least one year later. And the best read, the main readout from this study is going to be at two years, because mm -hmm. you think that's the, the function will improve and then it will plateau. And so it's a, it's a really uh, long time, but that raises also the question of what's going to happen to those cells in a diseased environment. And the short answer is we don't know, but we have some interesting data from fetal studies. I was actually involved in some of those studies many years back when I was still a medical student. We developed some of the first such trials back in Switzerland. And it was shown that actually the dopamine cells you put in, in this case from fetal cells, they actually age kind of at the normal age. So they're more like five years old after five years transplantation, mm -hmm. 10 years. 
So they seem to be less affected by the disease, but it's not zero. So in fact, when you go to 10, 20 years, you see some evidence of spread of the disease into the graft. Mechanistically very interesting because mm -hmm. those cells shouldn't have Parkinson's disease. Right, right. So there looks, seems to be like a cell autonomous process and that actually had some people to propose the Parkinson's disease is a prion-like mm. disease where proteins basically go step by step through synapses or unclear mechanisms spread from nerve cell to neuron, yeah. to nerve cell to nerve cells, including cells that were not really necessarily well, prone. Yeah. Well, let's hope that that is not happening in your <laughs> in your uh, trial patients. No, and no. Uh, maybe That's we should have this conversation in a, a year's time when you've sure. got your two-year two-year sure. endpoint. Sure, it would be very nice to see. But again, I think. For at least 10 to 20 years, I'm not so worried that the disease spreads. I think it's more the question, how much benefit can right. we really get? Do we get the right dose and do we make a true impact? And that's obviously the main goal there. Yeah? Excellent. Thank you very much, Thanks Lawrence. Thanks so much. Thank Great you. talking to you.